Hello there and welcome to season 15 of the Bitcoin Takeover podcast. I am Vlad and today we are talking with Alexei Zamyatin, who is an academic cryptographer or as he describes himself in the previous appearance that he had on the show, a recovering academic cryptographer who co-founded the Build on Bitcoin project, also abbreviated as Bob. And we're going to talk about zero knowledge proofs, rollups, side chains, all sort of crazy layer twos. And I'm super excited to have you, Alexei. Cool. Thanks for having me. And yeah, I guess I wouldn't call myself an expert cryptographer because there's so many people that understand this cryptography better than I do. But yeah, <laughs> glad to be here. Let's start with the spicy stuff because we had a launch last week. It was Citrea, the first project which claimed to have made layer two zero knowledge rollups. And I think Super Testnet tried to contest that claim in a space. And we also had a brief conversation and you told me you don't necessarily agree with the approach that they're making. Let's start with this. What's your take on Citrea? I mean, I, I've, I've talked to Orkman and his team, and I think definitely they're onto something. And I've, I've had a chance to kind of, you know, spend some time with them, with them online um, over last months. And they're definitely in the inner circle of people actively working on Bitcoin rollups. I do think, and we have this debate um, in the whole Telegram community around Bitcoin rollups. I think we need to be honest about what we can call a Bitcoin rollup today and what we can, and like, and what does it mean to be a ZK rollup? And arguably, Bitcoin rollups don't yet exist. We might be able with BitVM to do optimistic rollups where we have one out of N a security assumption where one out of the sequencers or operators needs to be honest, which is already weaker than what we see in terms of optimistic rollups on Ethereum where anyone can challenge the sequencer if they have the data. Whereas in the BitVM case, it's one out of N. And by definition, that's not a ZK rollup. And then we actually came to some form of consensus in the, in the in the community actively working on that space that we want to introduce this new category of BitVM rollups that by design are optimistic. You need to assume that one of the operators will be online to challenge potential attackers. And then within this category, we can have ZK optimized rollups, which arguably do increase security because the amount of data that we kind of need to use in the, in the challenges um, and we can all is reduced and essentially we can compress the complexity, the size of the programs that we're encoding in BitVM. And it allows us to fit more complex programs in um, 4 billion cycles, which is the current implementation that Robin and his team are working on. And that again, allows us to come kind of like manage with only 32 on-chain transactions for the challenges. And of course, every additional challenge means additional risk that the person challenging will go offline. So arguably, if you have a BitVM rollup that has ZK compression, it's more secure than without ZK compression potentially. But at the end of the day, and I think also Robin and SuperTest and went out to, to kind of clarify this, we have optimistic rollups. We don't yet have ZK rollups. There might there are first experiments which manage to encode a ZK verifier with some limited thing, like uh, execution into Bitcoin scripts, but that's a different team and it's super early and it's not really production ready or feasible. It's too expensive to use in production. So right now I would say I'm very excited for all the development. I'm very excited for, for uh, Chainway and Citria working on this topic. I really hope they succeed, but it is an optimistic role it, or as we should call them BitVM roles. Interesting. So how would you describe Citria? I mean, Citria for me, as they describe it is a ZK optimized BitVM rollup because they will use BitVM at least as of today, they suggest to use BitVM and encode a ZK verifier for their side chain or their chain in BitVM. But the verification is still optimistic and, and hence I think I will call it a ZK optimized BitVM rollup. Right. So you're saying that we haven't had proper ZK rollups into Bitcoin. And I think at this point, for the people who don't understand what this is about, it would be useful to define the terms. What is zero knowledge proof and what is a rollup? I mean, I think, you know, to even simplify it further, that maybe even before going into details of zero knowledge proofs, in, just in the context of rollups, the goal of a rollup is to inherit the layer one security, right? So if you roll up on Bitcoin, you want to inherit security from Bitcoin. And you want to be sure that users who bridge the Bitcoin into your rollup can always get it out. 
And in a way that is correct based on the rollup rules. So if the rollup allows you to send your Bitcoin to somebody else, then Vlad, if I send you Bitcoin on the rollup, then you should be the one who can withdraw it back to Bitcoin. And you want to make sure that these rules are adhered to. And if I deposit my Bitcoin into the rollup and I accept the rules of the rollup, I want to be sure that Bitcoin will enforce them. That's the ultimate goal. Now, the, the term ZK in this case comes from zero knowledge. And the whole goal is basically to encode um, this, this validation, the validity of the rollup into something more efficient. Because what we don't want to do is for Bitcoin nodes to fully validate the rollup and for every Bitcoin follow to have to run additional nodes for all other rollups. And what you actually want is to be able to verify a very concise proof that everything that happened on the rollup was correct. And these concise proofs we can do using zero knowledge cryptography. And ultimately the, the zero knowledge actually is not really relevant in this case, it's not for privacy purposes, but really compression. You compress the complex validation into a succinct, efficient proof, which can be verified in constant or logarithmic uh, execution. And that ideally should make it possible to have multiple rollups around Bitcoin, which we can then um, verify. And the verification means that the whoever is operating the rollup, so whatever entity or group of entities that operate the rollup, they cannot steal the money of the users on that rollup, and that would be enforced by Bitcoin. Now, this is not yet possible on Bitcoin today. And what we ultimately will probably need to, to achieve this is to be able to encode a ZK verifier. So a program that can verify a proof about the correctness of the rollup directly in Bitcoin script. Whether this is done by adding additional script functionality or adding a dedicated opcode for a ZK verifier to be defined, but that's ultimately what we will what we'll need most likely to achieve this. And that's essentially what people define as ZK rollups on Ethereum. It's off-chain programs or chains or separate blockchains where the state and the changes to that state are proven to the layer one. So you know that every transaction is actually valid without having to run a full node. And that's what a ZK rollup allows us to do. And no, we don't yet have this on Bitcoin today. I think the easiest explanation for what a ZK rollup is, I think my camera died, but I'm gonna fix that, is that it's transaction batching, right? You take multiple transactions, you batch them together, you do that zero knowledge compression, and then you insert the zero knowledge proof into the blockchain via inscription or whatever. And you're gonna be using BitVM or some sort of verifier, some sort of virtual machine to make sure that the transaction is correct. Am I missing something from this explanation? Well, well, that's that's what I would call a ZK optimized BitVM rollup, right? Because we put you in that case, what you described, you're posting data from the rollup to the Bitcoin layer one so that ensures that we actually have the data to construct the proofs. So the sequencer is not withholding that data. Um, and then you can actually use BitVM in this case to optimistically verify, which means we assume that it works until it's challenged. Right. So you assume that it's fine. And then you, there is seven days or another period of time where one of the BitVM operators who is assumed to be honest will challenge this um, submission of the proof or the state or whatever action that is currently being made by the op by the attacking operator if it's invalid. Right. So that's what optimistic verification means. And that's what I would consider a BitVM rollup. And in this case, it's enhanced with ZK compression. But a ZK rollup, as we would define it from other ecosystems like Ethereum, and I would actually apply this definition to Bitcoin as well. If it were a full ZK rollup, you would not need BitVM. You would basically have a program on Bitcoin in script that would allow spending Bitcoins only and only if they actually were unlocked on the rollup. So let's say you want to withdraw from the rollup, then this program would accept a zero knowledge proof that, very, that validates that yes, the rollup state is correct and that you actually are allowed to withdraw Bitcoin from the rollup to your um, personal account. And that would unlock the UTXO basically for me to, to take the Bitcoin out. That would be a ZK rollup. And of course, there's other things on top of this, but ultimately the difference is 
in the ZK rollup, as we understand it in other ecosystems, and I do believe we need to adhere to this definition because otherwise it's very confusing. A ZK rollup has the assumption of guilty until proven honest. You need to prove that you behaved correctly. You need to prove a correct state transition. You need to prove a transaction on the rollup. Whereas an optimistic rollup, as in the case of BitVM, it's vice versa. It's honest until proven guilty assumption. So in BitVM, we assume everything is fine. And Vlad, if you want to withdraw your Bitcoin from the rollup, you will say, okay, I want to withdraw now. And then there's a seven day delay, for example, the seven days is just an example, where I could go and challenge this and say, actually, no, you're not allowed to withdraw. You're lying, you're trying to steal. And that is that means that there needs to be someone honest and online to go make that challenge. And this is the big difference between ZK and optimistic rollup. And of course, ideally, we would have ZK rollers because guilty until proven honest assumption is stronger, right? Because you don't have this reliability on someone to be online. You just only do an, an action if you get a proof that everything is correct. Whereas an optimistic rollup, and in the case of BitVM, you would execute this transaction unless someone challenges. And if nobody manages to challenge on time, then you might be able to steal. And that is the big difference between optimistic or BitVM and ZK rollups. And ultimately, we all want ZK rollups, but today they're not yet possible on Bitcoin. I've heard people compare rollups with sidechains, and there are some nuances involved, but at the same time, they can be regarded as competing approaches, with sidechains being more conservative and proven over the past decade, because they have been around since the sidechain white paper, which was published by Blockstream 10 years ago. And then we have ZK rollups, which are more avant-garde, to put it like that. And they also have greater promises because in the case of side chains, you only move the activity to another chain, which is pegged in different ways because some people claim that liquid is a side chain and it has a different sort of pegging and trust model, but they peg to another chain and they do something identical to Bitcoin, but on a different layer. And in the case of rollups, you actually have some expectation of data compression and some verification. It's more cryptographically advanced. So how would you compare the two concepts? I mean, I think the term sidechain and L2 and rollup, they're all convoluted. And in fact, sidechain has been used as a term for anything that is adjacent to Bitcoin in its periphery. I mean, if you call Liquid a sidechain, you might as well call Ethereum a sidechain. What, what makes Liquid a sidechain in this case? I mean, and there's been multiple discussions, right? Of what, what actually makes you a sidechain. And okay, the only thing that Liquid has that Ether, Ethereum doesn't have is that it accepts the wrapped Bitcoin as fees, arguably, right? That's, that's the assumption. So it uses Bitcoin as a fee currency. But ultimately by now on Ethereum using a kind of abstraction, I can also, I will be able to pay fees in, in wrapped Bitcoin, which, which is also a multi-sig based wrap Bitcoin solution, just like Liquid. Does that make Ethereum a sidechain? So I think that definition is just outdated. For me, a sidechain should inherit Bitcoin security. Liquid does not inherit Bitcoin security. Liquid is a federated system. And, you know, we can also call, if Liquid is a sidechain, then everything, like many other things can also be sidechains. So it's very difficult to compare that to a rollup. At the end of the day, what we perhaps want from a Bitcoin layer two and maybe to answer the question this way, what we want from a Bitcoin layer two is it should inherit Bitcoin security and it should have a native bridge that is enforced by Bitcoin so that you know that Bitcoin will not allow the operators of that layer two to steal. And sidechains today, well, some of them inherit some of Bitcoin security. So merge, rootstock is a merge mine. So there's an opt-in mechanism where miners can also secure rootstock. It inherits some of Bitcoin security, but not all of it, because Bitcoin will not fork if something was wrong on rootstock. Like there will, there's no enforcement of Bitcoin. Bitcoin does not even know. A Bitcoin follower has no idea what's going on on the RSK chain. But it does, but some miners will dedicate it for work, which makes it more difficult to attack rootstock, right? So that's what merge mining gives you. Liquid doesn't have that. Liquid has a federated bridge. So there's a multisig that could, holds the Bitcoin. Rootstock also has a federated bridge that where there's a multisig that holds the Bitcoin. Arguably, any rollup today will have some form of multi, like any project as of now without BitVM will have a multisig that holds the Bitcoin safe while they're used on the other chain, whether it's a rollup, 
or a sidechain. And in the future, and I think that's what rollups, where rollups kind of want to advance the space, the goal is to be able to lock the Bitcoin in a contract. And this contract will only unlock Bitcoin if when they're supposed to be unlocked. So when somebody is withdrawing from the rollup, that's the goal. And with a ZK rollup, it will be a contract, right? Enforced by all Bitcoin full nodes. So you know that you know, Bitcoin is actually verifying that, yes, Vlad, you're allowed to withdraw your Bitcoin from the rollup because you, they accept a concise proof without having to validate and run a full node. They just get a proof, which is mathematically, which basically mathematically proves that, yes, Vlad, it's okay for you to withdraw. And with BitVM, which is kind of what we can do probably by the end of the year in production, hopefully, or a proof of concept at least, and will be will allow us to encode this in an optimistic way. So you have the program is not on Bitcoin itself, but it's off chain. And then what all full nodes verify is if you lied and you're trying to withdraw, although you shouldn't. And I think rollups, if we use that terminology for things working on BitVM and like ZK, ZK rollups and ZK verifiers are definitely advancing the space. But there's nothing preventing a sidechain like Rootstock or Liquid from adding a BitVM bridge and potentially expanding to be a rollup. So that's why I'm a bit cautious with the terms because ultimately a rollup, a sidechain, they're all separate networks, right? They're standalone chains that ideally should inherit Bitcoin security and use Bitcoin for its consent for their consensus, and then have a bridge where it's that is natively enforced by Bitcoin full nodes. And that's the goal. And arguably, none of the existing systems have that today. Yeah, I want to talk more about this and get to build on Bitcoin, which is your project. But before that, I got to mention today's sponsor Wasabi Wallet, which is the layer one, a base layer wallet that helps you do Chami and coin joins. Basically, you are participating in a collaborative transaction with hundreds of other users around the world. You don't know who they are. The coordinator doesn't know who you are. Everything is covered by the Tor layer. So your IP address gets obfuscated and then the output becomes indistinguishable from the inputs. It's pretty cool. Check it out. Download Wasabi Wallet for free today at wasabiwallet.io. And if you also want to use those Bitcoins, you can use them to buy stuff. There is a buy anything button that got included since version 2.0.5. And you can use that to basically contact a seller who's going to tell you what they have and what's available. You tell them what they want and you can get that delivered to your post office box or whatever in a very private way. Check out Wasabi Wallet. Thank you guys for sponsoring. Now, Bob, let Bob, I called you Bob. Now, Alex, say, let's talk about Bob. Yeah, I mean, I, I also think like, um, but yeah, let me talk about Bob. So before diving into Bob and trying, I don't want to shill anything here, right? Um, so I'm going to take the approach of we've worked on trying to, you know, get side chains to work or like decentralized trustless bridges to work on Bitcoin for, for a long time. For me, it's, this is my ninth year researching and working on top of Bitcoin R&D. Um, and one thing that we realized over, over time was if you're building a sidechain in a rollup, there's three things you need to solve. There's three problems. And I'm speaking not about security. I'm speaking as a rollup as a product in this case, something that will get adoption and actually solve real use case where people will actually use it. You need to solve the Bitcoin problem. So how do you, and that's what we just discussed today. How do you inherit Bitcoin security? How do you get a secure Bitcoin bridge? How, pe how can people you know, bring the Bitcoin into this layer of yours and get it out securely? That's a very big problem to solve. And that's what we're focusing on. But then there's two others that are equally as important. You need to solve the problem of ecosystem building and you need to make sure that projects that build on your layer can actually have a fast go to market, that they have all the infrastructure they need, that they actually can build products and that they are successful. Because ultimately, if you launch something which you consider secure and great, but nobody else builds on it, at the end of the day, it's pointless. And if nobody uses it, you've added nothing to, this, to the ecosystem and you know, you've added nothing to Bitcoin security budget, you didn't solve the problem. And then point three is liquidity. At the end of the day, blockchains, decentralized networks, we are, these are financial products. At the end of the day, we're transacting value and we need liquidity. We need to be able to send around assets at a greater scale and we need access to stable coins. And this can be debated where the Bitcoin will replace the dollar in the, in the distant future, but today people want stable coins. 
And I think we've seen that, I mean, the, the Lightning thesis of people that using Lightning to transact a value has been proven wrong by the majority of people in, in the global south and countries where you have hyperinflation using use the T on, T th uh, on Tron, right? So ultimately what you want on a layer or two on Bitcoin is you want access to stable coins and other assets so people can actually transact, exchange value and use it for whatever they want. And you need the liquidity for it because if I'm bridging my Bitcoin to the to the, your layer two and I want to buy stable coins because that's what can actually I can that's what I can use to pay my merchant and I cannot even buy a single dollar or I can buy a hundred dollars but like a 10 percent um slippage basically where it's because there's no liquidity then I'm not going to use it and um our approach with Bobus is pragmatic and not many not everybody will like it but our vision is okay well we want to focus on the Bitcoin problem. So we want to really work on securing securing BDC bridges. We want to work on, okay, contributing to BitVM research and how we can actually build bridges with that and later rollups and solve that problem. That this, that requires almost all of our attention. So, but we still need to solve the ecosystem and liquidity problem. So what we do is we say, okay, well, we'll use the Ethereum virtual machine as the main programmability layer. Why? Because that's the number one smart contract layer in the world right now. That's what most people use. And that's, what also like has the most infrastructure that you basically have all the big infrastructure providers like RPCs, um, smart contract developer interfaces, the like tooling, developer experience tools, um, oracles that give me data about the real world, all this infrastructure that has to be in place for a DeFi ecosystem and other Web3 ecosystems to exist is already there on EVM. Why? Because there's a multi-billion dollar market on Ethereum and other EVM networks where some of it is nonsense, a lot of it actually does bring value. And you can try to fight against that as well and try to solve the Bitcoin you know, bridge problem and how to bring Bitcoin in, into the ecosystem. And then you can try, of course, to come up with your programming language, your own virtual machine, but you run out of money at some point. Like You can't compete on all fronts. And our approach is pragmatic. I spent, we've worked with other virtual machines. We work with Rust and WebAssembly, and that's great technology, but ultimately the tooling is not there yet. And if I cannot get a team that's deploying on my on my layer, on my platform, to go to market within a year or even a few months with a prototype, because it takes them so long to build all the infrastructure from scratch, which EVM chains offer you out of the box, then I'm doing something wrong. And then I'm basically sending all these projects that would come to my layer in, into bankruptcy at some point. So that's why EVM right now, as of today, is the easiest way to build decentralized applications. And that's why Bob uses the EVM, because it is, to this date, like the most usable, the most advanced, and it allows us to focus on things that are on the forefront of innovation. So rather than us trying to figure out how to you know, build a IDE that allows a developer to you know, do write efficient smart contract tests, we can focus on a kind of abstraction, which allows users to pay fees in any asset, not just the underlying BTC or ETH or whatever, but in stable coins, whatever they have in their wallets. We can focus on better wallet experiences, social sign and social recovery. And that's again, why EVM is in my opinion, the way to go for now at least. And then the third problem, um, liquidity. Well, again, that's a big question. How, how do I get stable coins onto my rollup? Like if I don't have stable coins on my rollup, then I don't cater to the majority of, of crypto users today. Now, how do we get stable coins? Well, I have to bridge them into my rollup somehow. So either I go to Circle and, and Tether and ask them to natively mint stable coins onto my rollup, or I have to import them from somewhere else. Now, what I can tell you is that no, Tether and Circle don't deploy new chains. You need to have a lot of TVL, a lot of traction, and negotiate for, for a long, long, long time. And there's big networks like Polkadot and Cosmos that would have been working on this for like two years until they got this to, got this to work. So as a new layer, you're dependent. You're again, if you, you're basically dependent on centralized parties to provide you with stable coins. And yes, you can launch your own <clears throat> decentralized Bitcoin back stable coin, but ultimately, if it only has adoption in your rollup, you're still going to struggle. You need to have global adoption. And ultimately today, people use USDT and USDC. And if you don't have that, app developers 
will prefer to go and deploy another another chain that actually has this because that's what allows them to go to market faster and actually build a successful product. And this is why, and that's and that's probably going to like confuse a lot of people. Instead of launching Bob as an isolated system like Liquid today or Rootstock, right, which is not connected to anything and needs to build a Bitcoin bridge and needs to bridge assets in through centralized bridges from Ethereum and other networks, we decided to bootstrap Bob as an ETH rollup. So we start, instead of being isolated, we say, okay, well, I don't want to come up with my own consensus. BitVM isn't ready yet. So instead we inherit Ethereum security and this allows us to onboard Ethereum users and users on, this other, on these other networks into Bitcoin and allow them to use their assets to buy BTC, buy ordinals, buy whatever asset they want in the Bitcoin ecosystem and get them working and building on Bitcoin. And of course, this also provides us and projects building on Bob with access to infrastructure tooling, access to exchanges, access to on and off ramps, and all of these things that you just simply need for a successful ecosystem out of the box. And this does come with a price tag. Of course, this does mean that, yes, we are also dependent on Ethereum for security. But ultimately, I would argue, if I were to now go and bootstrap my own network today, I would never get even close to the security of Ethereum, simply because in practice, it is more secure than anything else except Bitcoin. And that's essentially what Bob is. Bob itself, and maybe I need to differentiate, there's the Bob stack, which you can use to build a rollup around Bitcoin or a sidechain, if you want to call it, and that can have different consensus protocols Comes, that's all the tools, and you can launch it only as a merge mine sidechain. You can launch it only with BitVM in the future. And then there's Bob, the actual rollup itself, which in the first instance is going to launch as an ETH rollup for bootstrapping. So you can actually onboard and use stable coins, you can use exchanges, and then add merge mining security to the sequencers, and then add BitVM for the bridge, and then become an optimistic Bitcoin rollup in transition to being a Bitcoin rollup when we manage to create this in, Bit, in BitVM. So essentially we're choosing to inherit ETH security and be connected to the Ethereum ecosystem and to act as the middle ground between Bitcoin and ETH rather than launching an isolated chain and just wait and then only become a rollup when BitVM becomes available. Does that make sense? Let me explain to you what you're doing wrong right now. So you're looking at market data and you're looking at volumes and you're looking at TVL and you're looking at actual numbers about usage around the world instead of being dogmatic. You should be religious about this stuff. If it's built on Bitcoin, BOB, you should only build on Bitcoin. What is this travesty to build on Ethereum, whatever, just because it's the most tested and the most used by developers around the world? No, you should be 100% zealous about only sticking to Bitcoin. If it's not Bitcoin only, it's a shitcoin. And if it's a shitcoin, therefore it's worthless. And I'm going to disregard all of the activity happening in third world countries right now and only assume that in my first world within my Twitter bubble, that's where everything is happening and where it should be happening. And if Bitcoin is meant to scale beyond my bubble, then it should be through federations which are built with Fedi or whatever, which are basically banks. Doesn't that make sense to you? Anyway, after this joke and before we move on, I have to present another ad for Crypto Steel. They are the original metal backup device. You can get them from CryptoSteel.com and also use promo code BTCTKVR for a 10% discount. You never know when your house catches fire or when there's a flood. Put your backup on the steel plate and it's going to withstand all of these hazards. It can only it can also resist earthquakes, as in physical damage. You're going to recover it, and you're going to be able to get your Bitcoin back. So check out Crypto Steel, and thank you guys for sponsoring the show. And now you're you're going to have to react to my joke, Alexei. Sorry for the delay. I mean, you, you had me there for a second. I was like, oh boy, like this is going to be a spicy discussion. I mean, look, I, I think I, I consider myself a pragmatic symbol. I, 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 I... I am a Bitcoin maxi by my own definition. Like I've always worked on Bitcoin. I've, my entire career in this space has always been, okay, how do we make Bitcoin more useful? How do we make it more accessible? And if I cannot change Bitcoin, which I've accepted, it should not add smart contracts. It's not for, meant for this, right? The UTXO model is not meant for smart contracts. It's just by design not. 
And Bitcoin is the defense layer. Like that's the last stand that we will have. Everything else breaks, Bitcoin's still going to be there. And if Bitcoin falls, so does the entire crypto industry. Everything else falls as well. And by that definition, for me, working on Bitcoin and trying to build side chains around it, it is a way of being a maxi. Now, being dogmatic about it and saying everything else that isn't directly on Bitcoin, everything else is, is a shitcoin, I don't believe in that. I mean, by, by that, that's, I mean, for various reasons. But ultimately, you it might be that for you. Like if you if and I, I mean not you, Vlad, in this case, because I know you're making a joke, but I mean wh like Bitcoin is what you want it to be for you. You can use Bitcoin should be used by you however you like. If you want to use Bitcoin for sending RGB USDT representations on the mainnet and use that as your main way of transacting, do it, right? If you want to inscribe an order note. Do it. Why not? It's it's meant to be an open permissionless system. You can't have it both ways. You can't say it's a permissionless system and it should be for everyone. And then nobody, but you should only use it as I like. And um, rejecting everything else outside of Bitcoin is also a mistake because ultimately a lot of the innovation in terms of ZK cryptography and a lot of this stuff is no longer happening on Bitcoin. During my research times, a lot of the, today's researchers that are building Starkware, the Celestias, the Arbitrums, the Optimisms, the Avalanches, they all came from Bitcoin. They were all researchers trying to make Bitcoin better, trying to fix it, make it more scalable. And, and at the end of the day, they realized, okay, Bitcoin doesn't change. And they left to do something else, to basically be try to build new innovation unconstrained and yes you can say a lot of these things also enabled scams but ultimately bitcoin also enables scams i can go and inscribe a brc20 token in ordinal i can do whatever i want and scam people today right so calling everything else a scam is also wrong and at, and ultimately you know for me pers like I, I prefer to be pragmatic about this so i went to argentina and i wanted to see how people actually use digital assets there and and, and i did go through this process of buying pesos with usdt nobody accepted bitcoin there stable coins that's what people want and if it's on tron and it works they'll take it and i think this is a luxury that many of, of og bitcoiners and like bitcoin maxis don't like they have a luxury to say oh I will diversify into Bitcoin and I will tell people you should only use Bitcoin because it's a better mine, but better money and everything else is a scam. But you forget the, ma the majority of people globally have other problems. They, they don't have the luxury of rejecting everything around them and, and trying to you know, live in a bubble which only accepts Bitcoin. Yes, we should aim to create and enable this parallel economy where people accept BTC. But in all my time working with Bitcoin, the only times where I could pay with BTC was at Bitcoin conferences. And even there, it wouldn't work every single time. And kind of coming back to, 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 the, to the whole kind of discussion and joke, um, I think if we reject everything else that's happening outside of Bitcoin and ignore what people actually want, then what are we even doing? Are we solving a problem? If the problem today is people want stable coins, even if we think that maybe these stable coins are not decentralized, but they need them to get access to the financial system and it's solving a problem for them, then I think we should actually try to solve it rather than insisting that no, it should be Bitcoin and it should be Lightning, even if you can't use it. And even if it doesn't support stable coins. And, and I think that's my pragmatic take on it. I, I And I, that's why when I say I'm a recovering academic, because academia is about this. Academia says... Let's focus on a theoretical problem that I think is important. And then I will pitch it in my academic paper and explain to the reader why this is the biggest problem in the world and why my solution is the best. And I'll ignore everything else and the fact that this problem might not even be practical. And that's why I left academia, because I wanted to work on real world problems. I wanted to work on things that actually get people that were probable products that people can use. And if we could do this on Bitcoin, I would... When we would have done it on Bitcoin already, but ultimately we need, in my opinion, layer two is we need layers around Bitcoin that can inherit Bitcoin security and that can learn from other networks like Ethereum, because ultimately Ethereum has solved the problem of doing fair exchange and transacting in a more efficient way than Bitcoin today. And you cannot deny that if you look at the numbers and the adoption of stablecoin transfers and how people actually interact with Web3. And we now have the chance to actually get this back to Bitcoin. And if it means learning from mistakes, 
what other ecosystems did and also ag adopting things that worked, then we, I think we should do it. And I'm not ashamed and I stand by the fact that, yes, I mean, we will roll up to Ethereum initially because that's, in my opinion, the best thing to do because it's more secure than just me controlling the rollup. It's more secure than a multisig and it solves more problems. It solves problems that products and builders that I speak to and have spoken to over the last year that they that they actually want solved. So yes, I, I think that's for, from our perspective, that's the way to move forward. Yeah, you do have quite a few comments from Christopher M that come from Twitter. And I'm not sure if I should read those first or ask you the next question. So let me tell you what he's saying. He says, your approach to software development does not accomplish its goal because you're talk taking a shortcut of conceding consensus, the most important element of the blockchain. If you're building on a centralized network, then you're building a sandbox. Might as well deploy on testnet. If you're building scaling via centralized networks, why wouldn't we just use MongoDB or SQL? Injecting a centralized layer two on top of Bitcoin rem removes all the properties that make Bitcoin important. Surely, as an academic, you can see this. You're saying the account-based model beat the UTXO model, not that ETH solve what Bitcoin couldn't. We had everything ETH network has on counterparty before ETH. Okay, these are the comments. You pick the order, I, I guess. I think there's like two things in here. There is like the question of, okay, does building a centralized layer on Bitcoin solve the problem? No, it doesn't. That's what I'm trying to say. I, and that's what I try to convey with, with sidechains. Like if we, I don't believe that when, if we launch a multi-sig based solution like Fedi or Liquid, that that's the final solution. They work today and they solve a problem and that's legitimate. And you should be honest. And I think that's the important part, be honest about the trade-offs. Like Binance and Coinbase solve a problem on and off ramps, right? And the transacting against dollars. And Fedi solves a problem and like Liquid solves a problem. Maybe one does problem solving better than the other. Maybe one problem is bigger than the other problem. And that's why one of these gets more adoption than the other. But ultimately what I'm trying to say is that we need to create rollups that inherit security from Bitcoin and they should not be centralized. But the fact is we don't have it today. And to get more resources and actually get people to build on this, we need to bootstrap it. It's not like you can't build Rome. Rome was not built in a single day. You, I know we all want ZK rollups, but also if we want to, Bitcoin to change, we need to prove first that there is demand for this. Because right now, if you look at existing side chains, we haven't proven that there is demand for Bitcoin rollups. By, by all means, we haven't, right? There is proof that there is demand for ETH rollups. So let's prove that there's demand for Bitcoin rollups. Let's work with what we have today. Let's bootstrap, be honest about this tra trade-offs. Like that's very important. Users should know what they're getting into and ultimately work on solutions like BitVM and ultimately hopefully get to a ZK rollup on Bitcoin. But you can't just, you know, wait for Bitcoin to change and add a ZK verifier and then say, well, now you can build a ZK rollup without ever, anyone actually caring about it. And in terms of counterparty, I mean, I, the only thing I can say to this is there's a reason why Tether went from counterparty to ETH. No, it, it was Omni, not counterparty. Sorry, you're right. My bad. But they were similar, right? It was by definition, I mean, maybe let's say color coins. Yes. So color coins versus um, account-based smart contract layers. I mean, ultimately, there's a reason why it's no longer adopted. It's It works well for payments. UTXO, the UTXO model is much more efficient for handling payments than account-based models, right? But unfortunately, if you want to build a smart contract, I mean, Cardano tried to use the UTXO model for smart contracts, right? And that didn't, and like try to build DeFi applications on top of it, and, and that didn't turn out well, simply because the account model is probably more efficient and better suited for decentralized financial applications. And we see this by the adoption metric. People build these things and they use them. And in my opinion, we if we could build this on Bitcoin with UTXOs, we would have done that. And I've, we've tried, and many people have tried. And the, the result is it's limited. And, you know, counterparty, the fact that counterparty and like any color coin protocol, like even if you take RGB, BRCs, ordinals, if you want to make every transaction hit Bitcoin, you're going to wait for 10 minutes, you're going to hit Bitcoin scalability limitations. And you're limited by um, Bitcoin script. And another point to point out here is client-side validation. So, you know, you post some data to Bitcoin and me and, and my friends that, you know, know what this data means, we will use it to run a protocol. 
you will see BRC20s and ordinals, all of them moving towards adding a consensus layer. Because having a global state where you trust that the majority of operators, however they're selected, whether through mining, through staking, are honest, is what people want. Because not everybody can always run a full node and validate every single transaction manually. And then you get disputes about the state and so on if there is no global state. So no, I don't think counterparty solve this problem. I don't think BRC20s or ordinals solve the problem of programmability for Bitcoin. It's a piece of the puzzle, but it's not the final solution. And yeah, I mean, we see it in practice. Yeah, I got a, I think I have two more questions that are important. And we only have 15 minutes left according to the time that you gave to this interview. And I got to present two more ads. So I'm going to do a rapid fire presentation. One of them concerns the scaling layer for, for Bitcoin, which is called Sato chip that produces a $20 product that's called Sato dime. It's basically a way for you to transfer Bitcoin without it moving on chain. You load it up with as much Bitcoin as you want. You give it to someone else in hand locally, and you're going to be making Bitcoin transactions like this without actually leaving any sort of evidence. You can call this a layer two if you want, or a scaling layer, whatever. They have cool designs. They're only $20. I think promo code BTCTKVR works for a small discount. Check them out. They're really cool. Satochip.io or Satodime. Look them up. And the second and the last ad for today, and I know, Alexei, I can make very good use of this time to ask you about your knowledge, is for IVPN. IVPN is one of the leading VPN providers. They don't ask for any sort of information. You don't need credit card. You don't need email. You don't need anything. You can pay with Lightning for all of your top ops. You essentially buy more time. And it has this account-based model since we talk about this. It generates a different account for every time you try to sign up to the service. And it's just letters and numbers. You paste that into your application and you get access on up to five devices, if I'm not mistaken. If you want to try it out, it's pretty cool. It has fast servers. It has pretty good privacy. It's, it's been around for like 20 years. Send an email from your trolling account to trial at ivpn.net, and you're going to get a code so that you can try IVPN for free for 30 days. So Sato chip and IVPN, those were the last two ads. Now, Alexei, I got to ask you a more controversial question. What do you think about drive chains? So the idea itself, I think, is interesting. And it has been debated for eight years. And I mean, I think there's many reasons why it's not activated. And it's not necessarily about the tech. I mean, yes, it introduces risks. And I think there's been a lot of debate on whether miners can steal or not. And like. Honestly, I think drive chains is a very interesting proposal. And I do believe that um, ultimately it could be a very useful thing to have. I don't think that drive chains in its current form is the best way to achieve this secure bridges. Um, because like, but these are technical details, like the long withdrawals. And I think like the way it is currently presented without also talking about the drawbacks on Twitter, I think that's not the right way. So for me, I'm a bit torn. The way that it is presented as the ultimate solution, I don't agree with that. The fact that it could be a way to improve bridging to side chains, yes, I think that's definitely a solution that's worth exploring. I think now it has contenders with BitVM and then ultimately other um, upgrades that might offer better solutions in the future. Um, but then ultimately, I also believe that we won't be able to activate it until we prove that there's demand. Like, I'm, I'm generally of the opinion that you can't go and say we need a software for Bitcoin because that will enable everybody to come and build on Bitcoin. And if we had this, we would not have Ethereum. Sure, but like that doesn't that's not how it works. Um, just copying if like Ethereum will not switch to becoming a Bitcoin draft chain. Like you need to figure out a product, you need to figure out a layer two, you need to build an ecosystem around these draft chains for them to be valuable because otherwise why would miners merge mine them? Why would they even care? Why would miners even like run this? So I think I will abstain and then kind of judging whether this will be activated or not. I think it's worth debating. I respect Paul a lot for, for his work and, and I had the chance to meet him in person a few times. Um, my take is, well, let, let's validate that there is demand. Let's, you know, 
use what we have today without pushing for soft fork. Let's create this ecosystem. And once we have created it with the tools we have today, as secure as we can do today, maybe and being honest about the risk. So not saying things, you know, calling things a ZK rollup when it's not a ZK rollup. And then asking for these minor changes or big changes to Bitcoin core and having the community then, you know, debate whether it's useful or not. That's the approach. So technical, very interesting. The way it has been approached over the last eight years, in my opinion, not the way to do it. And I understand what hasn't been activated yet. I think it's funny because drive chains are simultaneously in these two states. They're either not interesting enough to replace the chains that exist with altcoins, or they are dangerous for Bitcoin because if they get too much traction, they're going to lead to MEV or basically basically disrupting the mining incentives. It, it's always but you'll funny. Have that anyway. But you'll have MEV anyway. I mean, the, the MEV becomes relevant. I mean, not in the sense that you have it on ETH with front running, but the, the thing is with MEV, there's many definitions of like what MEV is. And arguably there is a very famous paper that highlights that Bitcoin's consensus will become unstable without the block reward. The moment you have the transaction fees being significantly higher than the block rewards, you will have miners gaming it. They're trying to get the most efficient and the, the, the highest paying transactions and they'll try to bribe each other. If you see a juicy block with 100 Bitcoin in fees, from game theory perspective, if you find you, you could try to fork it and then leave, let's say, 30 Bitcoin for the next miner, miner to actually build on your fork. And from game theory perspective, it really kind of opens up a lot of uh, vulnerabilities there in terms like again from from people misbehaving if they're economically rational actors so i like i i don't buy this argument like you that that drive chains enables mev yes you you kind of inherited a bit because a, a you miner might try to might have an inherent interest on on the roll up and then try to manipulate on bitcoin to kind of you know because it, they can make more money on the roll up than than what it costs them to attack, to attack bitcoin that's the same for, for rollups ultimately. And if you go down that road, I mean, then nothing is secure ultimately at the end of the day. So I I don't think that's that argument is 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 valid enough, is strong enough to reject drive chains altogether. I mean, if we are concerned about MEV, then we should leave Bitcoin as is and not not add anything on top. And then we should reject side chains and rollups and tell people to go build on altcoins. I think that ship has sailed a long time ago. We have counterparty. Someone can sell a Satoshi Nakamoto rare Pepe card, which is like one Bitcoin or whatever, and someone else intercepts that transaction and the miners figure out, okay, that one is like $10,000. It's worth more than the fees that I will be collecting from this next block. Maybe something can happen there. So I think that ship has sailed long time ago. It's just that maybe some developers don't want to see a certain type of stuff being added to Bitcoin and they come up with all sorts of threats that can already be used against network participants. Anyway, I have one last question for you and I know you have another call in 10 minutes. I don't want to take, you know, your opportunity to speak with other people or maybe take a bathroom break after this. So I know that there are lots of proposals for covenants these days. First of all, do you think that Bitcoin needs them? And if yes, which proposal is your favorite and why? So yes, I do think Bitcoin needs covenants because they will, I mean, so, and then like I'm wearing two hats here, right? So wearing a hat of somebody who's tried to build Bitcoin bridges and like side chains, yes, like anything that we get by this stage helps. Like I'm, I'm, at, I'm at the point where I don't even demand any specific covenant. Op CTV, Op Cat, any one of these already helps us improve side chains and bridges and makes our lives easier. And I do think, yes, we need covenants for exactly this reasons. I am a proponent and believer that yes, we need to be able to build side chains and or layer twos or rollups, whatever you want to call it around Bitcoin, and that covenants make this easier. And yes, covenant covenants might also help with lightning and other applications like Arc, for example. So there is enough demand, not in only in the side chain layer two camp, but also in the payment channels camp to highlight the need for covenants. Which one? I mean, currently I'd lean to Opcat and not because Eric and Udi are trolling about it, but because um it, for BitVM, which I think is one of the most important inventions and innovations in the Bitcoin space for at least the last couple of years, 
it's the most useful one. And it does, uh, like, basically, it's more powerful than Opsi TV. And there's arguments that, you know, Satoshi disabled it. It was in there already. So I'd probably go with OP cats. And yes, there's lots of memes around it as well and lots of education. So, um, but ultimately, from my understanding, is we were pretty close to activating OP CTV after a long like process of bike shedding and go back and forth. And now we have other proposals getting traction, which again just delays the whole integration. So my concern is yes, like I'd rather have OP cat, but if it takes another two years, then no, I'd have I if I would pick OP CTV today over OP cat in two years. And I think that that would be my answer. It's funny because Andrew Polstra, who is the chief research, chief of research, head of research, something like that at Blockstream, he had a similar argument, but he was very much in favor of OpCat and said that he would rather have OpCat now than have OpCTV and then maybe OpCTV does 90% of the job and then you need the other 10% and then you're going to get more debates for another soft fork to get added. So he would rather just have OpCat. That was his argument. So it's I mean, interesting. Absolutely agree. Yeah. It's interesting how this is similar, but the OpCTV people, they say that OpCat is some sort of PSYOP or whatever, a diversion, something to not activate OpCTV and in the end not have any sort of Covenant soft fork at all because new proposals keep coming, they divert, they distract the attention, and it's hard to form consensus around anything. I don't think it's a PSYOP. I think the people who are loud about OpCat, you know, are actually, they really want it. But yes, I can see the argument and the concern that yes, it, like the more proposals we get, the longer it will take. So at some point, like I, I see the, the merit in the logic, not that it's a PSYOP on purpose to delay it, but yes, it is, of course, the result is the same. Like now we are debating which one do we activate versus, okay, is Op OpCTV, like, is it okay? Shall we do it or not like now or, or whatever? Okay, so actually the last question before I let you go, how can people follow you and how can they keep up with Build on Bitcoin? Um, so you can follow us on Twitter. So myself, Alexei Zamyatin, a well, difficult name to pronounce, but uh, since we're live streaming on Twitter, you should probably find it easily. And you can follow Build on BOB, so Build underscore on underscore BOB um for updates and yeah we're very active on twitter we have lots of research coming out also around merge mining and a lot of new tools and products that are going to be announced over the next couple of weeks so yeah very exciting times and um another one that i recommend following is bitcoinrollups.io um it's a very good resource to learn about big, like bitcoin rollups and kind of try to you know cut through the noise and get a better understanding of what is actually real and what what works and what doesn't um, disclaimer, I am like one of the I contribute articles to this, but so do other layer two and roll up projects. So I think it's a very like, neutral ground, I think. So if you want to read up on general Bitcoin roll ups, that's also a good place uh, to start. Thank you very much, Alexei, and I look forward to see what you're building. Amazing. Thanks for having me.